You may remember that in 2017, Wonga experienced a data breach where up to 270,000 customer records were accessed. We're now seeing the use of AI tech to combat this issue. We're going to discuss this further in this episode of Intelligent Tech. We're joined today by multi-award winning CEO and founder of Castle Point Systems, Rachel Greaves. Rachel, thank you so much for joining us today. Can you start by telling us a bit about yourself and Castle Point Systems? Of course, yeah, thank you. Uh, so I'm Rachel Greaves. I'm the CEO and the co-founder of Castle Point Systems. Um, my background is in um, audit and compliance. So I'm a certified auditor and a certified security manager. I'm a certified privacy engineer and I'm a certified records manager. And I'm the regulatory lead for the company and I designed the solution. Um, and what the solution does is it um, registers and reads all the information in a whole network. So that can be on-prem, cloud, structured systems, unstructured, any format of data. We do the work of reading all the words in all of that information and we register and catalog all of that stuff. And once we have that, we use that information to find things in the environment so we know what we have and where it is, to um, classify things in the environment so we know what has risk and what has value, to see who's doing what to the information, which is very important for security audit, privacy and integrity reasons. And finally, and most importantly, to know what rules apply to that information. And those rules could be secrecy rules or records retention rules. We know what rules apply to all of that stuff and whether they're being met or being broken. So that is uh, Castle Point's purpose. And um, it's great to be here with you talking about it. Great. And Rachel, was it from your prior work as an auditor that you developed this idea for Castle Point? And could you tell us a bit more about your prior experiences? Yeah, of course. Yes, it, it was really. Um, it was what I found in that role that um, inspired me to design the solution and motivated me to do the work to make it a reality. Before we built Castle Point, there was nothing in the world like this. There still isn't really. We're what's called a category defining um, software. We're a new kind of AI, a new kind of paradigm. And um, the reason we developed it was um, a few reasons, really. Firstly, we were auditing um, large government departments um, in Australia and elsewhere and large corporates. And what we found consistently was that all these organisations were failing in their obligations. I failed everybody every single time. Um, and that's not a great feeling usually. It's important work, but it's not very rewarding. And what became pretty clear is that... Um, Number one, these organisations weren't failing in their obligations for privacy and security and, and compliance for want of trying. There really was a strong appetite to do the right thing with information. They were failing because they just couldn't succeed. Uh, it's too much data, um, too many systems, many too many rules, and not enough human beings to map all of that together because of the not just the volume of information but the velocity of change and the variety of information it's um, it's overwhelming for humans to manage and match that. And as an order day, it made it hard to do my job. So I would have to do sampling. Um, and I remember at one point I did some sampling and I found um, something on a, an unprotected drive that was an extreme national security risk and was sitting completely unprotected in this environment. And I reported that and said, well, look, I found this and this is a serious problem. And the response at that time was, yeah, but you just found one. So it's probably OK. Um, but it, of course, it's not OK. Uh, and the fact that I found one doesn't mean there is just one. It means that I'm a human being and I couldn't read two terabytes of files. But the, you know, the 400 files that I did read, I found one of those in there. So when you can't evidence the scale of a problem, it's very hard to get buy-in to solve that problem. So that was part of why I designed the solution initially to help me do my job, uh, which is actually quantitatively report and assess on the scale of risk in the environment. But um, as we went on, and I kept finding these really egregious things, you know, that was just one of many things that I found that could have directly caused loss of life in a national security context. Um, mm. I, I did some more reading 
and some more discovery and reviewed more audits that other people had done. And I found some more terrible outcomes, things that had happened to people, particularly vulnerable people, um, because of mismanagement of their information, because of this, you know, volume, variety, velocity problem. Um, and that really motivated me to to do to do something a bit bigger, not just build a tool for me to use to do my job, but build a tool for everyone in the whole world to use to do this job. So we could avoid those kind of impacts on the people that we're responsible for when we capture and we hold their data. Great. And so in that example you've discussed, it's clear that Castle Point is able to um, deal with these types of national security risks. So am I right in understanding that it can help organisations to identify weaknesses in the data sets that they collect? That is right, yeah. So managing risk is obviously a really key point. So we all have what's called dark data. We've got, we've got things all over the place. Um, no one really knows where they are, how bad they are, how big they are. They're usually hiding out of sight and they might be really old or they might just be somewhere unexpected, but nobody knows where they are. And if we can't measure it, we can't manage it. You know, if we don't know where it is, we can't protect it. So, um, so Castle Point's first purpose is to just shine the light into every single corner of the organisation. So we can know what we do have in everybody's email, OneDrive, file shares, Salesforce, Jira, Office 365, um, legacy systems that aren't even in vendor support anymore, old Lotus Notes files and zip files that we can't even open as humans. We need to know what's in that stuff because even if we can't stumble upon it, a threat actor can and will. So knowing what we have is important just for productivity. You know, we waste a lot of time searching. Um, we want to re-monetize the information we already have. We want to be able to find things quickly and make good evidence-based decisions. It's useful to be able to search, but it's also a risk management strategy. Once we know what we have and we know what's really risky, and we've used artificial intelligence to interpret how risky that information is, for example, does this relate to not just PII and PCI and all those basic things that, you know, everyone can find automatically now, but our particular trade secrets, our particular sensitive information, particular things that fall into the scope of a secrecy provision in a law that we need to comply with, you know, things that are more bespoke in terms of our risk. We need to know where all that stuff is as well. And the reason we want to know about it, number one, and find it is so we can protect it we can harden it where it is in the environment, and most importantly, so we can get rid of it. What IT has done for a long time in the cyberspace, and I'm a, you know, a cyber person, is focused on reducing the likelihood of a breach. And that's really important. We want to keep doing the work to make it less likely that we're going to spill our data or have somebody come into the network and take it. Uh, but we can never reduce the likelihood to zero. There's always a trusted insider. Um, there's always misconfigurations. Accidents happen. Um, we'll never reduce the likelihood to zero. But risk is a, is a combination of likelihood and impact. And if we just focus on likelihood, we're missing a big opportunity here to reduce the impact. And that's what Castle Point really helps with. It says, well, now I know not just what you have, but I know what of that is risky and why. I know who's doing what to that information, who's touching it, sharing it and downloading it. And really, really importantly, I know how long you have to keep it under law. And as soon as it reaches its minimum retention, Castle Point will tell you this can be disposed, this can be destroyed. You, you are legally allowed to destroy this information now. And if you do destroy that, when you have a breach, the breach will be as small as possible. You will have reduced the impact of that breach as much as you possibly can, which is why tools like Castle Point, this next generation information lifecycle, cover discovery, audit, privacy, cyber, and records, because it's all one solution to one big problem, which is risk and value balancing of our data. You mentioned Castle Point's use of AI to interpret risk. So, What's your opinion on the UK's approach to AI regulation, and in particular, the UK's AI white paper? It's really the same flavour. <laughs> it's the same It's the same solution in a different font as the EU, New Zealand, Canada, the US, and now Australia, and a lot of other jurisdictions as well. We've actually had ethical and responsible AI best practice for a long, long time. Australia actually was one of the first governments, maybe the first government, to have an ethical AI framework. 
Um, UNESCO's had one for a long time. The G20 um, have had one as well. So we've known for a long time that best practice with AI is to make it ethical and responsible. And responsible means it's explainable, it's contestable. And because we knew that back then, when I was designing this system, we designed it then to be ethical AI. So we're in a great position now, I have to say, um, now that it's becoming law, well, that's what we already do. And it's actually quite rare to find artificial intelligence that doesn't rely on machine learning or neural networks or generative AI to do the kind of things that we do, which is auto classification. But um, those AIs that are black box AIs are about to become obsolete because of this legislation. People don't realise that um, decisions we make about managing information can have real impacts on real people. And as I mentioned before, some of those impacts uh, are what motivated me and inspired me to go forward and, and do the have the lifestyle that I have, which is pretty punishing sometimes, um, of, of starting a new company and running a business like this um, and growing it. Um, so, for example, um, in Australia, our, our government um, deported one of our own citizens, a very vulnerable woman um, with a mental illness found with a head injury, who was deported um, and left in a home for the dying and destitute in the Philippines um, because they couldn't find her record in their record keeping system. Um, she, she had never picked her child up from childcare that day and he was put into the foster system and she wasn't repatriated for a long time until a good Samaritan tracked her down and that all came about because the data wasn't discoverable and that's not a one-off we had the same thing with Cornelia Rao locked in immigration detention because her records couldn't be related across the environment we've seen um, Indigenous reparations in Australia for the stolen generation um, and the Maralinga atomic testing unable to be paid because records were destroyed when they should have been kept. In the UK, we saw the Windrush generation being unlawfully deported again because their records were destroyed when they should have been retained. Um, we see these issues all the time and we see real harm on real vulnerable members of the community because of decisions we make about keeping, destroying and sharing information about those people. So information governance is actually, I would consider, in the high risk category for AI and ADM, um, which is why it's so imperative for it to be explainable and traceable and contestable, uh, which, is, which is how ours is designed and how I hope to see more solutions like this emerge. And Rachel, you mentioned these ethical issues and you know, we have a lot of clients that are in the financial services space. Would you expect these types of issues to pop up you know, in, in that type of space as, as well? And, and what are some of the ways in which Castle Point can um, assist financial services institutions with those types of ethical issues that you've discussed? Yeah, absolutely. So obviously we need to see patterns of who's doing what to information, as I mentioned, because we can detect a lot of things happening there that shouldn't be happening, um, whether that's fraud or malfeasance or whether it's just mishandling. Um, and negligence, which um, unfortunately are common as well. But um, what we need to understand with financial services is that um, we we are financial services organisations are usually large. They have a very large footprint of staff and a, and a high churn of those people. So it becomes very hard to scrutinise and monitor those people uh, in terms of screening when you hire them, training them um, to keep them on top of their security obligations and also monitoring their ongoing behaviour. And the risk we have um, becomes one of a trusted insider. And that trusted insider can be recruited by any other threat actor, by organised crime groups, um, by syndicates, by activists, by foreign state actors for various purposes. Um, financial services are now considered critical infrastructure uh, in the UK and in Australia and in the US um, uh, are considered to have a national security risk because foreign state actors, the first step they will take if they were to invade or start a conflict is to shut down banking systems, grocery systems, transport systems, electricity systems, etc. cetera. So, um, so financial institutions that used to just have to worry about fraud and maybe privacy now have to worry about national security as well. So how do we manage the trusted insider risk? Well, trusted insiders are what we, you know, in the cyber world sometimes call mice. 
um, there's really only four things that motivate uh, a trusted insider. It's money, um, ideology, uh, compromise or ego sometimes. So when we can monitor the activities of people in the network and see what they're saying, who they're talking to and what keywords come up in those conversations, we can start to get some hints maybe about whether they're having issues with money, whether they have ideological beliefs that might cause them to become a trusted insider, whether they're at risk of coercion or they are being coerced or whether they've got an ego problem <laughs> and they just want to cause some trouble. Um, this is where we get into different ethical issues of AI. When we start looking at behavioural analytics and surveillance, we have to make very cautious and informed decisions about how we use AI to do that and making sure that bias isn't encoded in that process and humans are in the loop. So that's a big topic, but that's just one example of how being able to see everything that happens can help us make a picture and find flags of things that we might want to act on sooner rather than later. You mentioned there the importance of cybersecurity and AI surveillance. In your opinion, do you think stringent AI regulation would hinder the use of AI in surveillance technologies, or do you think it's only a good thing? I think it is. Um, you know, the nature of humans is that we're incapable of doing only good things. Um, we will do bad things, um, either on purpose or by accident, and that's normal and that's expected. What we do know is that there are organisations who are incentivised to do the maximum bad thing possible with AI. So um, we need to understand how it can be misused, not just so we can avoid misusing it ourselves and going against our own codes of ethics or morality or our value systems in our culture, but also so we can understand how a threat actor might be using it against us. So the more we can talk about the risks of AI, the better, because it helps us do good and it helps us see, identify and react to people doing bad, uh, either deliberately or accidentally which can happen as well. Right, and Rachel, so one of the things you've discussed is the perhaps use of this technology to do good things for people. Uh, you've identified these challenging um, incidences that have perhaps happened in the past from the incorrect collection and use of people's data. So perhaps people need to view this technology as something that can have a really positive effect um, rather than um, you know, uh, it being here to take my job or to, uh, in some way, shape or form, uh, you know, control my life. So is there a positive side to this technology that people should be embracing? Definitely. I think there's there's two lenses for that to look at. Number one is the is the impact on the individual using the AI. And number two is the impact on the community and on the end stakeholder. It's easy for us when we work in a business to, to look at the world just, just like we're watching TV, like we're just seeing what's happening, but we're not a part of that picture. And the further removed you are from your stakeholder through more and more layers, the less of a real person they seem. So it's important to remind yourself that at the very end of this value chain of the process you're doing or the data you're managing is a human and a human who could be vulnerable and a human who deserves um, respect and protection. Um, and when we hear stories about Vivian or we hear stories about, you know, Paul Maguire who died in a mine here in Queensland because of bad data management, a young father of two small children, it, it starts to become more real. But if we can understand some of the positive impacts that we can have, have, that can also help. One, you know, doom and gloom is one thing, but it's also important to see how our use of AI can make a positive difference. So, for example, just in the last, you know, few months, a uh, few years, We've been involved in, in a lot of fantastic outcomes. We worked with um, one of our um, consulting partners um, who were working with the state government department on an inquiry into child abuse in the public service. Uh, they'd had a nurse um, for 18 years working in their health system in that state who'd been preying on children that whole entire time. Uh, which came to light because of a podcast of all things and led to a government inquiry. And our partner had spent about a year manually searching one of the child protection databases for flags of abuse. And they'd found about 5,000 flags of abuse, but were then confronted with the big child protection system, which hadn't been searched and couldn't be searched manually anyway um, because of the way it was configured. 
Um, so they brought us in at that point. So, so we took those flags and we coded them into one of our AI ontologies and we ran that across the first system and we found all 5,000-ish matches, 100% accuracy uh, to prove it out. And then we ran it across the big system. And within just a few weeks, we found another 60,000 flags of abuse in that system that otherwise wouldn't have been returned to the inquiry. So that's some of the good that we can do with AI. So if we can understand as a user who's worried about their job being taken away, look how much good impact I could have. That's good. But users also need to understand what's in it for me, right? So what we tell people is that at the moment, you're a miner. <laughs> you, if you're a knowledge worker, you're a miner. You spend all day underground, in the dark, dirty, <laughs> sweaty, searching for gems. Like you're just digging all day out of sight of the rest of the organisation just to find these gems well, when we use Castle Point, Castle Point does that digging for you. Machines are much better at digging. Um, they go faster, they go further, they don't get any, you know, they don't get tired. Um, so what you become instead of a miner is you become a jeweler. The machine brings you the gems, which is the hard, dirty work, and you spend your time crafting them into jewellery, into something more valuable and insightful and useful for the organisation. That's what humans are good at, is higher order thinking and planning and strategy. They're not good at searching and digging and matching, um, but machines are great at that. So when we work together, we change our role. We take away the drudgery and the toil of our role and we free ourselves up to think and make good decisions based on good data, which coming back to the beginning is why I designed the tool originally, so I could make good evidence-based decisions and recommendations based on comprehensive, accurate, proven data. Well, thanks, Rachel. That was an absolutely fascinating conversation. Yes, thanks so much, Rachel. Make sure to tune in to our next episode of Intelligent Tech.